Um, uh, the next speaker is going to be Alison Reinheimer Moore, who is originally from Quebec, but now lives in Toronto. And because if you live there, it's Toronto, otherwise, it's Toronto. And she is going to give the talk in English, she's decided. I think I'm good. Hello. The fact that I couldn't give it in French because I don't have the vocabulary for it is a main reason why this talk will be in English. Um, like, who knows what they call APIs in French? I do not. Um, so as, as mentioned, I'm Allison. My Twitters are at Schmaliso. And we're going to talk about APIs today. I came to write the docs two years ago. I missed last year. I was very sad. Um, and it was just so exciting to be in a room full of people who care about documentation and who care about um, providing good user experiences for the software that we work on. And I left here just like super inspired and like, woo, docs. Um, and that was really nice. And the other thing that sort of stands up, stands out for me, other than like lovely people doing lovely, interesting things was that I talked to a lot of people who said, like, oh, what do you work on? And I said, oh, API documentation. And then they'd say, oh. <laughs> we have an API that we're about to release, and I need to document it. And I've never done that before. And I'm like, OK. Like, so like, what tools do you use? Have you used Madcap Flare? What do you think? And at the time, I had never used Madcap Flare. Sadly, a month later, I got a new boss. Um, but. <laughs> So like, I tried to answer questions the best I could, but two years later, I have better answers, and so a talk. Yay. <laughs> so uh, about me, quickly. I have a master in information. I'm one of the librarians, except I didn't learn anything about being a librarian. Um, I like, focused on um, information architecture and systems design, but like, the American Library Association accredited that thing, so I count. Um, I'm an information architect and technical writer. I like knitting and tea and cats, which I'm sure distinguishes me from everybody else in this room. <laughs> um, and I'm currently a software engineer at MongoDB, which means people on LinkedIn are very confused by my skill set, um, because we are all software engineers in engineering. Um, I usually write comma documentation so they understand, but people on LinkedIn are confused. Um, before that, I worked for Oracle on one of their cloud products, writing API documentation. And then before that, I was at MongoDB. Again, it's complicated. We can talk later. It'll be fun. <laughs> um, so here's the agenda. We're going to like do a really short, like, what's an API, in case somebody hasn't encountered that, because that seems like nice. We'll all be on the same page. And then we'll get into the meat of the talk, which is really going to be um, about questions, because I don't know what API you're documenting. Like, I don't know what kinds of APIs you're documenting. I don't actually know how to tell you how to do, live your lives. But I have lots of questions you can ask yourself that will help you live your lives better API documentation-wise. So we'll talk about taking stock, organizing, and then a little bit about tools, a very little bit. There'll be like a short Madcap Flare rant, but it'll be very brief. Um, and so a very short intro to APIs. So this is like a really good API definition. I like this one. It's a set of requirements that govern how one application can talk to another. Like, it's simple, and it's accurate, and it's good. And I got it from some guy who wrote a blog post on ReadWrite. Do with that what you will. Um, so that's really what they are. They like define how different systems can talk to each other. We're going to talk, for these purposes, about RESTful APIs. There are lots of different kinds of APIs. At my day job, I work for MongoDB. Um, we make a database. A very popular database, I have to say. Um, <laughs> well, I think we're like fourth in the world right now, which is pretty awesome. Um, and we have APIs that enable developers who are writing applications in their like preferred programming languages to um, interact with MongoDB without having to use the command line, which is like an obvious way that applications work. Um, so those APIs are like full of like classes and methods and programmy things. Um, REST APIs are also full of things that are like classes and methods, but aren't classes and methods. There are endpoints, usually, and parameters for those endpoints. Um, and probably most people are working on REST APIs when they say, ooh, you work on APIs. Um, so we're going to talk about those specifically. The same principles will apply, regardless of what kind of API you're, you're documenting. It's just like the actual code bits that will change. So REST is an architectural style. It's like the popular thing in APIs. Um, it was, uh, it was like proposed by Roy Fielding in 2000 and sort of took off from there. 
Most APIs are not actually REST compliant because there are a lot of requirements. Most of them are RESTful. People get really persnickety if you call it a REST API and it doesn't meet all of the requirements, hence the full. So that's good. And REST APIs generally, RESTful APIs, <laughs> generally um, meet these two things. They generally communicate over HTTP. So that's good. And they usually, for the most part, use some subset or all of the um, get, post, put, and delete HTTP verbs. Um, for reference, when you like get an, AP, when you, an API page, that's not a word. When you load up a, a web page, they are using the get verb to retrieve the web page. If you submit a form, it's using the post verb. So it's all sort of like, it's all consistent with how a browser works except with extra things. So that's our brief introduction to APIs. Um, this is like a good bit of API documentation, reference, reference documentation. This is from the Stripe docs. It describes the endpoint. It is a post, so you're submitting stuff to this endpoint. The V1 is the version. The charges is because this is about making charges. Um, oh, that was not as smooth. <laughs> um, oh! <laughs> Everything's fine. <laughs> it's all cool. It's just, let's just keep it casual. Um, good, okay. Must swipe in the right direction. Um, arguments, things that you can submit to the endpoint. Um, this, like, things are required, some things are not required. Isn't this lovely? It describes what an amount is. Um, that's good, this is turned. <sighs> good, and then over here we have an example request. So it shows you how to make a request. This is using curl because it takes up much less space than most of the programming languages do. And an example response. A good little bit of reference documentation. It shows all of the things I mentioned. Isn't that wonderful? Good. So we have a bonus bit of preamble. So I said we we're going to talk about API docs, and then we we're going to like dive into the talk. But that is a lie. Um, we're going to talk about my view of the types of documentation, and we can argue about classification systems later. But this is how I and my coworkers think of docs. Um, we sort of mentally divide them into three types: um, conceptual documentation, tutorials and reference, um, conceptual documentation being like the really wordy stuff that talks about how things work and how things interoperate and what, in, for an API, what the different resources are maybe, um, what are call, common call patterns, like what do the actual words mean, stuff like that. Excuse me. <coughs> I have a cold. Um, tutorials are like, you know, the, you understand what a tutorial is. Um, and reference are, the sort of nitty gritty, like, what are the endpoints? The stuff we showed a minute ago, what are the endpoints? Um, what are the different parameters? What are the units? What are the response codes? How do errors work? Are there limits? Stuff like that. And in our view at MongoDB, and in my view in general life now, um, you need to have all three types for different, different like, kinds of documentation, different things you're documenting. You might need more or less of one thing. For APIs, I think often the view is like reference is enough, and I will argue that it is not um, in the next bunch of slides. So this is foundational to how I viewed API docs and docs in general, so I figured I should talk about it for a minute. Good. So taking stock. What you have, what you need to write, and what matters to your users. So first things first, and this is just generally good practices. Who are your users? Literally, who are your users? Are they the same users as the other documentation you work on? When I worked at Oracle, we had API documentation that was for developers and partner companies that were extending our platform. That was a distinct audience. And we had the users of our platform who were mostly marketers um, doing marketing automation campaigns. And the twain never meet. Like, these are, there was not any overlap. And so that's a thing that, to be aware of, because um, being aware of your users is generally a good plan, but like this, being aware specifically of how your audience is segmented is, can be important. Um, what are their motivations? Is the thing that you are providing like mission critical? Is the thing that you're providing like less mission critical? Because this may inform the tone you want to write in. This may inform how, like, how much stuff you want to have before you're willing to go public with your API documentation. This is a good thing to be aware of. What do people actually want to do with your API? These are hopefully questions that the person who designed the API were al was also thinking about, 
but we're assuming at this point that you are inheriting the done work. So hopefully that's not the case. Hopefully they've thought everything through. Um, so what do people want to do with your API? Like, are they like, I really want to post to Twitter because you work for Twitter. Many of you work for Twitter. I've met some of you. Um, then like, hopefully on the next slide when we talk about what the API can actually do, these things are um, aligned. And what programming languages are popular among your users? With API docs, you want to provide code examples because, because you do. I mean, <laughs> because that's useful. So you want to write them in programming languages that your users actually use. And so hopefully there's a way for you to study this. Like maybe you think everybody really loves Java and then you write all of these Java examples and then it's like, actually, we all really use Node. And you're like, well, shoot. Like that was a lot of time that I spent not doing anything. Um, so that would be sad. So a thing to think about in advance. We have this idea of what our users want. Now let us have an idea of what we can actually provide. What does the API do? Um, what does it let people do? Why, did, like, why does this API even exist? What is the point of this API? Um, questions you may not be able to elucidate, but other people you can talk to and they will probably be able to answer this question. Um, <coughs> excuse me. How does the API relate to other APIs in your organization if you have other APIs in your organization? Um, thinking about Twitter for some reason. Because I'm really into Twitter APIs today. Um, there are APIs for posting things and then there's other APIs for like getting all of the stuff happening on Twitter. And so helping your users find the API that they actually want to use is like an important um, thing you can provide. And then how is authentication going to work? Because that's like often a really big pain point in APIs is like making your first call because figuring out like how to find your credentials and how the auth flow works and all that junk can be rather opaque if you just have reference. So that's something you're going to want to think through. Third set of questions. I told you it was all about questions. Um, where, where do you come in? Like, are you getting, what, like, what, how, what is your role here? What are you responsible for? Are you writing everything from scratch? Are you editing? Are your API developers generating reference from which you can work? Did they fill out all of the like, description sections in the code when they generated it? Or did they only fill out like, the ones they felt like? Like, how complete are you getting? <laughs> there will be an example later, and it's horrifying. Um, and I, I say that lovingly, because it's not on, like, I, this is an old, it'll be an old screenshot. It's not on the internet anymore. Good. They've, they've improved. Um, who's going to be writing the code? Like, is that in your skill set? Do you have the skill set to write um, code examples in multiple languages or in any language? Like, if you don't, that's cool. Like, that's great, but you're going to need to schedule somebody's time to do that. Um, and somebody will need to approve that time. So that is a thing to be aware of before you start, like, barreling down the road and then you're bamboozled for two weeks because there's a release and nobody has time to write docs examples. Um, I'm not speaking from experience at all. Like, that has never <laughs> happened to me. <laughs> that has legitimately not happened to me. But I can imagine it could happen. Um, another question, how are you going to handle versioning? Like, is this API going to be versioned? Because then you'll probably want versions of the docs, and that might inform what tool you use to make the docs or how you design the docs. Important questions. That timer and this timer are not the same. Okay. Um, and then finally, and this is a big one, Who's going to review what you write? Like, at MongoDB, we um, work on a database, and so people like really care about not losing their data. That is very important to users of databases. This is not surprising, but it is very important that like the docs not lead to people having sad times. So, <laughs> because like somebody made a typo and then somebody dropped a collection. Like nobody wants that. Um, so we have a fairly rigorous um, review process. We write our stuff, um, and we do all the writing ourselves. The, the tech writing team does all of the writing for the most part. Um, we then do an internal review within our team, so people read to make sure it doesn't sound crazy. Um, some of our team members are more capable of pointing out technical issues than others, but you know we all sort of attack everything for optimal logic and flow and goodness. And then, um, we then pass it on to the developers, and often, and Neil will be happy to hear this, somebody in support to review, right? Because they often are like, hey, this doesn't actually work. 
and the developers think it would, but it ultimately does not work as well in that way, and there might be like a better workaround, and the support people have, um, as the previous talk discussed, the support people have insights that the people who made the product don't always have, and that I definitely don't have. So thinking through your review process, especially for more technical stuff that like maybe you're not as comfortable with, um, is really important and something you want to think about in advance. So who's going to review your stuff? Let's assume at this point that you have answered all of these questions, these many, many questions. And maybe you've got like a list of tutorials you want to write and like some concepts you want to cover. And like you know in your heart you're going to need to have complete endpoint reference because it's an API and that's how they work. So we haven't really talked about this much. But like sorting things out seems like a good plan. And this is the second slide that involved post-its on a wall in this talk so far and we're only three in. So <laughs> what can I do? So concepts to cover for API docs. These are some examples. You might want to talk about the API call pattern. Um, in the next slide I'll show you some conceptual documentation that we wrote at Oracle for a bulk API that had a somewhat complicated process for getting data into and out of our application. Um, that just so that like you didn't end up um, locking the application for a long period of time. There were like ways that this was handled that were not entirely intuitive. Um, you might want to talk about common URI parameters. Um, if you have a concept called, well, we'll come back to that. And you might want to, you'll want to talk about the assets and describe them. The words on what they mean line, which is ambiguous, which is funny. Um, often, let, story time. So some years ago, I was driving to Florida. And um, I went to CAA. I'm Canadian. It's AAA, but in Canada. Um, and was like, I would like one of those maps that you guys do that like shows my way there. Right, because they'll like, they'll like provide this like map thing. You say like, oh, I'm going to Florida and I want to go through these places and they'll like provide a customized map for you and isn't that lovely? And they were like, oh, the maps are over there. I'm like, no, 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 that thing you guys do, like the map, route, the route map thing. And then they talked amongst themselves and they're like, oh, you want a triptych? And I'm like, do I? <laughs> like, <laughs> do I want three panels of art? Like, what are you, <laughs> what are you talking about? And they're like, no, it's called a triptych. And I'm like, okay, can I have one of those, please? And so sometimes the words that make sense to your organization internally are not the words that make sense to the world. And sometimes when you are designing an application or an API, for example, you might have used words that made sense to you internally that are ambiguous to the world. Like, what's an account? Um, in, my, in my marketing world, an account for us was like, your installation. An account for a marketer might have been like somebody for whom they were doing marketing. So it, if you just have like, you know, this is about accounts. Like, what, oh, I don't know what an account is. Like, I don't know what an asset is. I don't know what any of this is. Like, so defining the words and what they mean is like a good, a good thing to be handling in conceptual documentation. You should also be discussing it in the reference, but like in a more sort of introductory, here's how it works, let's tell the story of this API, conceptual stuff. Um, this is the API call format documentation. It's not how to make a call. It's like, here's a common pattern. Um, you define the import or the export. Here are some things about it. You move the data into the staging area, and then eventually you move it into the final destination. Um, and this is like in words, so, I mean, it's a little tutorial-y. It's a teeny bit, but it's not actually like, here are the endpoints, here's how to do it. Um, just a little, a little like overview of a general concept that will be useful to you. Um, tutorials, right? And that's my husband, so like, <laughs> admittedly, this is not the ideal person to be quoting because whatever. He wasn't my husband at the time, though. Um, he was just my boyfriend back then. Yeah, he's the Reinheimer and the Reinheimer Moore that is now making everybody confused by what my last name is. Um, so like, that actually happened to him almost exactly a year ago. It was apparently May 29th, 2015. Um, the API documentation for the API who's working on it work, or he was interacting with it work for like an important reason, and this was a big company's important API, was so bad that he downloaded a WordPress plugin. He's a PHP developer and he's not a huge fan of WordPress as a sidebar, so this is like particularly egregious for him. And like, but, like if they had just written a tutorial, they just, like a word I do not like. If the, the nice people at Company X had 
written a tutorial that said, here's how to authenticate to our API, that tweet would not have happened, and the world would have been a happier place. Um, and I would not have a slide, so maybe I should be grateful, but mostly I'm not. Um, this is, conversely, some ridiculous conceptual documentation that I provided at Oracle um, for like how our authorization flow worked, because it was very, very complicated, because OAuth is complicated. Um, for those of you not familiar, OAuth is, um, thank you, is a way of authorizing an application to act on your behalf. So like if you use a Twitter client, Twitter, if you use a Twitter client, I honestly, I think they're the APIs I interact with the most, which is why I'm like, Twitter. Um, if you use a Twitter client, you've probably used OAuth to like authorize it to post tweets for you, for example. And so we also had like a full tutorial, but like this stuff is really difficult and making the first call for a developer can be the thing that takes the longest when interacting with your API. Um, like once, once you can like send stuff and get stuff back that's a 200 something, like that's a success. <laughs> then, then you can like, you understand how endpoints work and you can like get her done. But until then, you're just sort of like throwing stuff at endpoints and like hoping that eventually you figured out how to authenticate properly. And that's, you know, not ideal, right? For, to tell your users how to authenticate. If you're only gonna write one tutorial, write that one. You should probably write others, but like that one's, that one's a good one to write. And then you, you want endpoint reference. Um, I wanted a picture. I couldn't find something with cats. So I was like, this will sort of work. There's not a single cat picture and I'm so sad. <sighs> so good reference. This is not an example of it. This is an example of sad reference. And, and this is not the reference that is provided to the end users anymore. And it is not even, I don't think, available on the internet anymore, so I don't feel too bad picking on it. I also like, worked for it, so I feel like, whatever. Um, they were aware that this was not optimal. So this is like an endpoint. Uh, what is an account, right? We've talked about that. And then like, why are none of the descriptions filled out? Like, why are none of the descriptions filled out? And when you click on things, like click on transform depth, what does that mean? <laughs> click on account view, right? Click on data view, right? Click on minimal. Oh, that's what my response will look like, but I don't know what any of these things mean. <sighs> and like, what is even a that? Like, oh, it was so frustrating. Um, and this is like generated API reference from the source. So maybe that's not gonna be functional for you. Like, either your developers are gonna need to buy into like updating the source, and adding many more words, which may not be popular, or maybe you're just not gonna be able to use the generated reference. Some generated reference is fantastic. Like, I think it's largely a function of how enthusiastic your developers are about documenting their code. Ours were apparently not very. Admittedly, this API was never supposed to be public, and, but then it became public, and that was another issue. Um, but, like, in comparison, Twilio, not Twitter, Right, Twilio has like lovely API reference. I don't know if it's generated or not. I did not ask people yesterday, but it's wonderful. Um, you know, it describes, it describes things. The description, it's got a description. <laughs> apparently, like, apparently, I am easy to please if you fill out a description <laughs> and just define what an account is. It, it is a single Twilio account. Like, good, good. Thank you for telling me what an account is. It's not like a phone number, which is conceivable if you are confused to think that an account could have been like some other thing than a Twilio account. Um, and a little bit further down the page, it tells you like, if you do a get against that endpoint, here's how it looks and here's the response. And like all of those things down the left were described above, like this is wonderful. This is the kind of reference you should be providing. And you can do it in multiple languages, which is nice, but like at a minimum, curl. Most people can just curl things. Curl's a command line tool for running um, request against a web server. So like, you can basically do anything with curl, but, um, but if you're only gonna provide one language, curl is the way to go. So yeah, we've got a good sense. We've got a good sense for what we're writing. We've got a sort of sense for like how it slots in and the different kinds of tone we're gonna be wanting to write. There are things to, now let's talk about production a little bit, and only a little bit. And I have assumed up to now that you have just received an API to document, that you are sadly not involved in its development, and that your developers have not bought into the wonderful world of documentation-driven API development, which is becoming really popular, which is great, where people write the docs 
to like define the spec for the API and then build the API. Like, isn't that marvelous? <laughs> and people keep giving like, like clever developers keep giving talks about it and I'm like, yes. Because then you'll like have thought through what an account is. Like you'll have, you'll have descriptions, you'll have defined things, you'll realize when things are crazy before you've actually implemented them. Um, so we're gonna talk about tools that assume you've just received and are going to be, you know, working with what you've received. I like Sphinx. This is not an unpopular opinion, I suspect. Um, you can just put things on read the docs and then it's legible. We use Sphinx at MongoDB for are like when you generate the PDF, it's like 3,000 pages. It's a lot of docs. We maintain a lot of docs with Sphinx. Um, it has a lot of good qualities. You can build HTML and PDF and EPUBs and like a single HTML, which is quite nice for API documentation because sometimes developers just want to like command whatever the Windows version, the thing F to just find the thing that they're looking for. People sometimes really like one long page. I'm not into it, I'm an information architect, but um, some people are really into it. And if you can generate it for free, like why not? Almost free, for like two minutes. Um, why not? And there's um, a quite pleasant, actually, a Sphinx extension that lets you do RESTful API documentation. Like you don't even have to hack it together, it'll just work. Isn't that wonderful? That would be my choice. That would be my first choice if I was writing API documentation and I needed to do conceptual tutorial and reference with one tool. But there are things to think about, like what tool are you currently using for your docs? Do you want to use the same tool? Um, maintaining different infrastructure is a pain in the butt. So maybe that's not worth it to you, or maybe it is. Like maybe the people who are working on API documentation and the people who are working on product documentation are distinct groups. And then like maybe it doesn't matter as much if they're using the same tool. Questions, all questions, right? Um, the other big thing, at least in my mind, is that like using a tool that is not well suited to um, a use case is also crappy. So like, which is crappier? This is, this is a great question. Like, which one's gonna suck more for you? Is it gonna be maintaining multiple infrastructures or is it gonna be um, using tools that are not ideally suited? Questions, questions to figure out. Um, this one's really popular with like techie people. Um, I like Slate. Slate is a um, open source documentation framework made by the lovely people at Tripit. Um, and it makes like Stripe-esque reference. The interesting thing about the Stripe-esque reference is that Stripe's reference is generated from code. So it's not actually Stripe-esque, like, because you have to write this yourself. But whatever, it looks like the Stripe documentation. It uses Markdown. You have perhaps read Eric's blog post about Markdown. <laughs> I have read Eric's blog post about Markdown and I feel the same way, but um, do with that what you will. It supports having multiple um, code sample, like samples in multiple codes, code languages, languages. It supports code samples in multiple languages and um, is generally like not hard to use. It doesn't have some of the, um, some of the like content reuse things that I like from Sphinx and other like I was gonna say better. Other like more complete technical writing <laughs> software. Um, but for reference, it's great. But you're gonna need something else to do your conceptual and tutorials anyways, because this is like not designed for that. So multiple infrastructures, do with that what you will. Um, this was like a big question that I had, and so we're gonna quickly barrel through. If you have to use Flare, and I had to use Flare, this worked. We had one endpoint per page. That way you could link to stuff because linking within Flare pages is not ideal. At least I did not feel it was ideal. Um, we made this like sort of crazy um, table thing. We had table snippets and each line was um, a condition and then we would specify the conditions on the documents so that the like lines in the table that we wanted to appear would appear and that way we didn't have to describe parameters a thousand times. We only had to describe them once. It worked. It was a little crazy, but it worked. And then you'll need to figure out some way to do syntax highlighting for code blocks if you're using Flare. Um, my solution was to use pigments to generate HTML that I then put into Flare. This is probably not the right way to do it, but I had already done everything in Sphinx, so I was disincentivized to find another solution. And also we had a bunch of languages that were not like supported by the code, the other um, highlighting things. So that's it. 
it's all about answering questions. Thank you so much. And before you clap, I have another question. We're hiring, so please come, please come talk to me. We need more technical writers to work on MongoDB. And we have now taken over the APIs, so there's lots to do. Thanks. 12 seconds. Yeah,